you were talking about some funny story that you guys had experienced with the thar oh yeah man the thar <laughs> so i am not a very big fan of the thar when the new one came out we actually went to check it out and we were planning on buying it as a daily driver because we were working together at a time in one of our businesses okay so uh, this is a couple of years back i'd say this is almost a decade back okay we were in goa and okay. he just come back for uni, uh, from uni for a couple of days so he okay. said okay what do we do what do we do we go to goa mm-hmm. so we like like most people who go to goa no, it was the first time that we were going to goa it's probably the fourth or the fifth time but we planned just a boy trip just him and me so let's get a thar to get a thar delivered at the airport uh, and the guy gives us the car everything first 5 10 minutes amazing you know you're in a uh, convertible car or like there there was no a uh, convertible it was just either it had a roof or it or didn't it have, did a roof. have a roof and yeah. ours didn't have a roof that's it it was there was no way of putting it back together because in goa they don't give you the option Correct. of giving you a canvas roof yeah. with it so it's either with it with the fixed panel in the older yeah. ones that used to come yeah. in it or without it True. and ours was without it and this is in the peak of summer and this okay. is the first time we're in summer in goa we don't realize how bloody hot it is okay so we get sunburnt like crazy dude like you won't believe we're like looking like tomatoes driving around in a fucking thar that's how sunburnt <laughs> we are we're so bloody hot and the ac on the older thars was basically next to non existent hmm. it was like a blower if you had your face next to it we would feel it like i told you yeah but otherwise it was non existent yeah and the biggest problem that we faced then was the gentleman for it, for, uh, put in a nice sound system okay, okay. What, by nice sound system i mean he was nice enough to put two speakers in the back of the car okay now the problem is what he put uh, was he paid an enclosure out of a speaker in a box and he put it right behind the driver's seat so the okay. driver's seat couldn't go back behind a, uh, beyond a certain point so here me and my brother both six footers we were driving like this straight you know like we can't even like we can't sit comfortably so we were driving straight because the, because seat seat can't go back a certain bit and how much can you recline the seat and drive like that True. because your feet are still straight correct so you know your uh, knees are paining by the end of the second day you're like dude this is some issue and the problem is we'd already paid up in advance for the whole thing so they they don't give a shit man if you're not feeling comfortable True. So we had other friends in Goa, and then we every time we met them, we we were like, "Boss, you are driving. We should sit in the back very comfortably, have a nice chill beer." And uh, that's the last time I probably drove a thar, man. I never wanted to drive a thar again. So I mean, clearly, after uh, the fact that you own the two classic BMWs, I'm sure uh, there is a certain design language that appealed to you, which modern cars just do not. I mean, if I'm to put it in layman terms, classic cars, you're able to speak to them. But a lot of these modern car uh, design languages, we're just not able to speak to them. So according to you, what exactly is that that appeals to you in terms of design language of classic cars? See, uh, in the older years, there was a lot more money spent on uh, developing these cars. Hmm. And over the years, because the economy is the world and how these automakers have also functioned, the budgets for building cars have really gone down. So now a lot of these cars that we get are all parts cars. They make one chassis and they'll use, a, they'll make a couple of parts or engines and they'll put them in every uh, car across their range. Hmm. Whereas earlier, what it used to be was if there was a car that was made, it was made from the ground up, particularly made for a certain reason. Hmm. that let's say one of the most expensive cars that Lexus ever made was their first car the LS400 mm-hmm. and the, the second one would probably be the LFA that made them break yeah. the bank yeah. because if you heard about the story you know that they lost money on every car they sold because they okay. first made the car uh, in aluminum and then they had to remake the car in carbon fiber the okay. whole car so they lost so much money but they wanted to get it perfect the engine was done by yamaha and i think it's one of the best sounding motors we'll ever get to see in our life mm-hmm. that v10 and mm-hmm. you should rev like crazy like mm-hmm. had the opportunity to see it in person and i can tell you it sounds like nothing mm-hmm. we would have heard it's closer to an f1 car than it is to a, a regular passenger car okay so going back on your point why uh, the older cars uh, because it's like like you said they talk back to you man they'll tell you you know if you're going to screw up with them if you abuse them too much they are going to abuse you right back believe me that happens a lot of times that they are going to break down on you but if you love them you cherish them you use them how they're supposed to be it's a very rewarding experience and i feel in cars now they just that much thought just hasn't been put into making modern cars 
a lot of the modern cookie cutter passenger commercial cars that we get here. Hmm. I'm not talking about something as special as like your Wrangler or like a sports car that one would get, but a regular cookie cutter car, hmm. you know. Hmm. And uh, another thing that I've observed is that uh, uh, I'm not sure the Toyota is a manual, right? The yeah, the Toyota is a manual. So, huh, one more thing that I've noticed and observed is that all the cars that you own, the Toyota and both the BMs, uh, they all are, of course, manual shifters. And back in those days, there was always an option of automatic. Right. So clearly, you do have a thing for stick shift machines. Is that right? If I'm, uh, it definitely is because uh, the stick shift is a dying uh, uh, this thing now. You don't, see, you'll never see them again now. Hmm. Most people are moving towards modern cars, and I also, in my daily driver, prefer an automatic car. Correct. So. Uh, uh, probably the next generation won't even know how to drive a stick shift car. Hmm. That's how bad it's getting, like how it is in the US that most people hmm. don't know how to drive a stick shift. They already, they, they already don't, right? So that's what I'm talking about. And Forget the, about a stick shift. I, yesterday I saw a video on a lighter note of this young girl who's the Tesla, the, the, the Tesla driver. Right. She learned how to drive on a Tesla hmm. and uh, her dad, I think he made her sit in one of, the, uh, one of those uh, automatic gear shifter cars and she's like, now what the hell am I supposed to do? <laughs> Right. Are supposed to break, would it not stop automatically? So, so people have been dumbed down to such a level that now human intervention, they want to minimize it as much as possible. True. And for people like you and me, what are we doing then sitting in a car if the car is driving by itself? What are we there true. for? True, 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 true. You know, so I feel like, I think I was talking to you, right? You, uh, you were telling me that you're coming back from somewhere and put the car cruise control. Uh, no, I was talking to someone else. They said that we put the car on cruise control. He's in a newer Fortuner. And he said, I, I couldn't possibly do it for more than 10 minutes because I was going to fall asleep. There was nothing that I was going True. to do. So uh, I feel that uh, you have to save the manuals, man. There are not a, a lot of cars and the old automatics used to be shit. Hmm. It used to be damn problematic. They were not fast at all. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I got rid of my E46 coupe also because it was an automatic. Had it been a manual, I would have never passed on the car. Mm -hmm. It was, it looked, the problem was the car looked like a bloody M3. It just didn't run like one. <laughs> and that was the problem throughout. <laughs> and since it was my first project car, so I was driving it while fixing it. Okay. So what the deal with the project car is you only start driving it once you're completely done with it. Mm -hmm. If you're driving it while you're fixing it, you get frustrated every time. Mm -hmm. Because I've driven the car for two months without a power steering. Because I couldn't find the right power steering part. And in, in India, in uh, Delhi, uh, a lot of major markets, which is basically Palika Bhavan and Khan market, where you get imported mm -hmm. car parts. Mm -hmm. They couldn't figure out the right pump for it. I Eventually, I imported the pump myself from the US. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. once the car was perfectly done, which was a year, almost a year it took me. I was so sick of it that I'm like, dude, there is no, uh, I can't drive this. And the second problem was the car was bloody low. So mm. you couldn't drive it everywhere. And we just started our food business then. Mm. So we would be at sites, catching sites. And the car was so bloody low that it was not practical at all. Mm. Mm. So the mm. deal was my dad said, either you drive it every day or you pass it on to someone who's going to enjoy it. Mm. Because mm. what's the mm. point of having it as just a motor, or just a thing standing there? On that note, I still remember because I've always been, uh, minus the fact that I have an automatic daily driver, uh, when I had the Thar and the Innova before that, I mean complete manuals, I still remember. I still right. remember putting up a sticker on uh, my uh, Thar's uh, quarter panel, which it was a small thing wherein a guy is uh, holding a girl's hand while driving mm. and there's a big red colored slap on that and it says, <laughs> because manual. <laughs> <laughs> See, dude, if you've driven as much as we have, uh, you can drive with your knees also. Driving a manual with one hand and still have one hand free. <laughs> so, it's just how much you've driven a manual. Like like I said, going back on what we said earlier, no one gave us the option. No matter what car you want, you want automatic True. manual. It was the getting a car was such a big deal. Absolutely. That, that uh, you know, you didn't care what it was. It was a manual or an automatic or whatever it was. Diesel, petrol, nothing. None of it mattered. And then comes the gypsy in my life, the RFC gypsy, which I picked up. And there you go. Forget about a stick shift. I have a hand operated accelerator with me. I was like, okay, <laughs> this is another level altogether. So that was fun. But uh, going a little bit uh, further back to your classic BMWs that you have, uh, where did you actually ended up finding them? And what made you 
think mm-hmm. that you know what let's get to finding these bmws that i'm looking for so i told you about the e46 story yeah. that i had uh, the car was supposed to be for him and we were supposed to work in the car together and then we started our business so we parted with the right, car right, we didn't right. have time to do the whole classic car thing mm. so uh, after i had sold it it was quite a setback for me because that's okay. when you know how they say you, uh, you don't value what you have until it's gone mm. it was a classic example of that Mm-hmm. So uh, after, right after I sold it in a couple of months, I realized what I had done, and how rare the car was. There are probably like three, four coupes in the country, if not more. True. So uh, and I was looking for the next thing now because mm-hmm. I needed a car, you know. Mm-hmm. So there are a couple of cars that I picked up in the middle. One of them being a Zen Steel, which I did a complete crazy Ooh, build on. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So I did. Oh, I nice. did. No, no. They're bloody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, they're death traps, man. Like that car really? is a bloody widow maker. So the car we built was a widow maker. But I'll tell okay. you what, we got an esteemed rally spec engine from a gypsy that had turned over. Someone had built up a really nice uh, gypsy and a rally spec gypsy. Don't widow. tell me you plonked that I, engine on. And we plonked that engine in the Zen steel. <laughs> so and I would drive the car and I'd no tell him, racing, no cage, nothing. Normal Zen steel <laughs> with rally engine. With, with suspension, with suspension <laughs> stiffened up. And wider tires, rally spec tires, and all okay. of that. But uh, we built it, and bro, the car was mad. It was a mad, mad car. Like even till the third gear, you couldn't get it going straight, and you okay. needed balls of steel to drive it. Because okay. the Zen is not a very uh, forgiving car. Forgiving car at all. At it was all. Not. So the funny thing was that every time we would go together for a drive, cars very light. If you're alone. This, so the slightest amount of weight difference will make a complete difference in the car's, uh, uh, you know, performance. Hmm. Every time the two of us would sit, we'd be like, "Yeah, this is not fast." But every time we would drive it alone, we'd be like, "Dude, we are going to fucking die in this." Well, you're, both of you combined are not the lightest human. Yeah, beings. exactly. I mean, so, so that would change the <laughs> dynamics completely. It would start handling better, but it would not be as fast then. <laughs> so it was a damn funny experience that we had. Okay. Then we had one more Toyota two door. Uh, what what was it called? Sickness. Uh, Sinos. 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 That okay. we bought from a relative of ours for next to nothing, you know. Okay. And we he had the car for a very long period of time. And then that car we fixed up, tried to fix up. Then a friend of ours, a gentleman who is now a friend of ours, a very dear friend. Uh, they have a garage called Wagon Street in uh, Punjab. Okay. So uh, they picked up the car from us, and they took the car, and the Zen Steel went to Bangalore. And uh, during all of this period, I got to know about the E30. Okay. So now going back on the E30 story, uh, one fine day I pull up in the Zen Steel uh, at our uh, kitchen in Sultanpur. This okay. is right behind the main road. Okay. And uh, so my landlord's brother comes across and he's like, "Oh, you're into older cars." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm into hmm. older cars. Tell me what's up." So he's like, "You know, my grandfather has a couple of older cars that he wants to part with, and he wants to downsize his collection because his age is not allowing upkeeping all all so many cars. So he had about okay. a dozen cars. So we make a plan, and uh, we go see the car. We enter his farm, and like a decently sized plot right opposite uh, uh, these DLF farms, and uh, a bunch of eclectic cars, about ten, twelve cars. None of them really were something that I would go crazy about." Okay. There was a Gen One MR2 that I was keen on, uh, maybe an older Prado, uh, but those are fairly common. Yeah. And then there were two cars in a cover outside, inside a parking, covered garage. Everything else was just thrown out in the open, left mm-hmm. to the elements. So I'm walking towards it and I'm asking, you know, what car is that? It's some BMW, but they won't sell it. So idea was they had a one two four, a left hand drive one two four car that they wanted to sell. That's what they t- took me to see. But they said, you know, this BMW they won't sell. I'm like, okay. Like, can I get you see it? Like, yeah, yeah, you can see it. Put up the cover. So as I was walking towards the car, I realized it's the right silhouette, you know, because the modern ones look completely different. Yeah, forty six, yeah, yeah, thirty nine look completely different. I'm like, maybe we have something crazy on our hand. So while I'm walking towards it, I'm like thinking, let it be an E thirty, let it be an E thirty, because for me, as far as I know, the most enthusiasts I speak to, that's the holy grail of all BMWs. The E thirty. That that's what makes like if you talk about a BMW and you show that image to. Uh, you know, anyone at any age, they will relate to it. They'll be like, "This is a BMW." <laughs> and we opened the cover, and it was a red E30. So now I had to keep a straight face because I can't show show these people that 
that how interested I am and you know I have found something crazy doesn't matter because they are not interested in selling no, it no no they are not interested in selling it but I still can't show them that I'm very keen on it because the price will go up as soon as Got you it. show emotions the price will go up oh, yeah, that's yeah, something yeah. you have to know true if you're dealing with uh, a classic car owner then you need to tell them their emotions but this gentleman was in the classic car owner yeah. he was his grandson so for him it was just bhangar correct ki aisa purana gaadi khada hai apne kisi kaam ka nahi hai but dene ka to paise zyada chahiye agar aapko chahiye to so uh, i called him continuously for a month a couple of weeks and he said boss it's not in my hand it's my grandfather's car this is his number please talk to him directly so i started calling that gentleman the gentleman made it very clear to me in the first conversation only that he's not interested in selling that that or the mr2 and a couple of more cars he said this is one or two cars i want to sell this is not something i'm interested in selling okay so over the next couple of months i would call him every few weeks every 15 days i would call him just check up on him how he was is that his health generally just have a conversation and get to know more about his car story as well you know okay so one fine day he tells me you know why don't you come see me now the problem was that we were in the hospitality industry working in the catering industry during winters peak winters which is wedding season hmm. and we would get free from our sites around 3 or 4 in the night hmm. and he would call us at 6 7 in the morning to meet him at the farm <laughs> or come okay. meet me uh, he had uh, gentleman happened to have an office at uh, in the, the chanakya hotel the shoka hotel sorry the okay. shoka hotel so he said either you come in the afternoon we'll have uh, afternoon tea there now we are back at business again in the afternoon because we are preparing for the next night again right we won't have any time so this went on for a month or so and then i spoke to uh, uh, an acquaintance of mine down south in coimbatore and i was like you know i am in a conundrum and i don't know what car i should buy next there's an e46 that i know of that i ended up later buying after a couple of years but that's another story i'll just okay. uh, tell you sure. and there's an e30 so he's like boss Now that I know there's an E30, if you don't buy it in the next 48 hours, believe me, I will. <laughs> so now I, there's a lot of pressure, and he's like, "What are you even thinking? You know, it's an E30, and this gentleman has two E30s, and he's like, you don't know what you, you know, because it's easily available to you, so you don't know what what it's worth and what the car is, right? So I make it a point. I get up one morning after sleeping. I don't sleep all night, and uh, I go and see him, and uh, we hit it off, and that I carry some money with me. and we close the deal then and there and in the next 24 hours because i have this pressure from that friend of mine uh, so i pick up the car in the next 24 hours before someone else can okay, and i pick it up and get it back home put chains on the car pulled it out of his garage pushed it onto the tow truck because all four wheels are jammed yeah yeah all four wheels were jammed oh my god so because it been standing for such Still a long period of time yeah, yeah. so and we got it parked outside our house in green park and uh, for the next 8 to 9 months uh, what happened was covid hit so uh, we thought okay we will make it a covid project we we'll tried to fix the car at home we got uh, a known mechanic as well from a friend of mine uh, harshit from sultanpur customs he tried to help us out with starting the car at home we got the basic service parts from khan market okay but the electrical issues were very big with the car it wasn't getting a uh, spark in the ignition so okay. we weren't able to figure that out So for the next eight nine months, I would just come back home from work late at night, pick up a chair and just sit, take off the cover and just sit and look at the car because I couldn't possibly get it running. And the passion was always there to you know to visualize the car running. Yeah, and, yeah pata ghor ghor ke start ho jaye. And mind you, this is not a private garage. It's just our ghar ka lane. It's parked in front of one plot, and he's sitting in the middle of the road with a chair at like three in the morning looking at his car. <laughs> so so because. if you if you crazy about something uh you're that crazy that you know you want you can visualize it running and see it True. you know how you envision it yeah 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 absolutely so i could see the vision even then the thing is when uh, with classic cars uh, in general either you have a vision or you don't yeah that's it if i have picked up so many projects after that that have looked like shit but by the time we've done with it, it it's been insane you can't tell it's the same car but you need to have that vision you yeah. need to see it for yourself before anybody true. else true, can true, 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 true. because the mechanic the body guy nobody else can visualize it the way you can correct and it's your vision that's going to make uh, you know be the end product and how uh, consistent you are in getting to your vision and how you want true. that car to be true. according to you true 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 so 
that's how we got the E30 man. We ended okay. up uh, caving in and then we took it to Phil. Uh, he did the mechanicals on the car, got the mm. car up and running. That took about one and a half, two years because that was also through COVID. I told you about the parts right. issues and all of right, that. Right, 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 right. And last year I got delivery on my 38th birthday for the car. Okay. So, uh, that was quite nice. We had the nice set of wheels and everything on the car. Then we later sent the car for a nice respray and all of that. <laughs> Ricky did a great job with the paint. Right. Still looks great. <laughs> and uh, that's the story of the E30, man. And it's still, uh, it's a constant uh, thing that we have to upkeep the car. <laughs> we have to constantly work on the maintenance of the car. But it doesn't break down on us. That's what it doesn't really break down on us. Nice. So, uh, the E34 was again uh, a known acquaintance had the car. The E34 is the white one. The white one, the white okay. car, the white 5 yeah. series basically. Yeah. It was yeah. a similar generation era. Right, the, uh, right, so, right, 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 right. So, right. why I wanted the E34 was because it was a 6 cylinder manual and I'd never owned a 6 cylinder manual BMW. So, I want to know what the fuss was all about. You know, because people say, oh, 6 cylinder BMWs, manual ones are all the rage, you know, they drive like amazing. And they do. They do drive very nice. Mm -hmm. I've had another E34 last year also. And that also was a six-cylinder mm -hmm. manual. But that was a 5 to 5 TDS. So, it, okay. it was okay. a bit okay. clunky. It had a nice pull because uh -huh. it was a nice diesel engine. Yeah. But uh, it wasn't uh, particularly silent. It was quite a loud engine. Like a train okay. going on. Whereas this, the engine is so silent that you can't tell if the car is on or off. And this, I'm talking about a car from 1994. Wow. Almost, uh, what we'd say, how many years? 30 odd years, man. 30 odd years old. Really? And the car is super silent. So, we got the car. It was a non-runner again. That's how most of our projects start. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, frankly speaking, our uh, budgets with buying cars are minuscule. So, we buy cars in the most fucked up states. You know, we can't go buy a... And what's the fun of buying a car that's already restored, right? Exactly. What are you going to add to it, right? Exactly. So, exactly. you need to have a challenge, something that sure. you can do. And you, I like to add value to cars, man. So, I feel that's the only way you can... Something that someone's given up on and you completely change it. It shows your effort at the end right. of the day. Right, 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 right. right so, right, right. Uh, the car was a non-runner again. So, I took a mechanic from a friend of mine's workshop where we had last met. Uh, Capital Motor Works, Arjun. Yeah. So, uh, he happened to be nice enough to send me some mechanics with me and uh, we tried to turn the car and the engine turned. So I was like, the engine turns, let's pick it up, let's take it home and we'll figure out what we have to do next. Okay. And we worked on the car, gave it all the love it deserves, gave it all the nice new parts, gaskets, did some work in the engine, uh, refurbished the cooling system, refurbished the fueling system, refurbished the braking system. Did this completely. car also get the stair from the middle of the road? And the chair? Uh, not really. Because for me, see, the E30 holds a very special place in my heart. Understood. It would take a lot for me to part with the E30. The Understood. E34 was more of a great business decision. Got I'll it. be very honest. Because once we decided that uh, uh, the classic car hobby is quite an expensive hobby to it have. Is. So, uh, you can't hold on to everything. So, some things you need to be uh, okay to part with as well. But it's a great business, but, I believe, uh, if, if you're able to nail it. It's okay, man. I can't say much because I've not been doing it for very long. Got it. But uh, if you love cars, then it won't feel like work. And I, I love these cars, so it doesn't really feel like work. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Got it, got it. And uh, I enjoy sourcing these rare, sp uh, rare parts for my cars. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So, we have a lot more builds uh, that are going on right now. Okay. Which is, one is a 1977 Isuzu Gemini Coupe, which was again a barn find that we found in the middle of a farmhouse from a very famous restorer back in Jaipur. Okay. And they want to part with the car. And at the time, I thought it was a great deal, but it turned out to be quite the opposite because okay. that car had nothing. It was basically a bare shell. Right. And the engine they promised me was working and they showed me it was working, had to be completely changed. But uh, the plus side is we did a proper resto mod on the car. Mm -hmm. So, it's turned out pretty great and I think it should be up and, it's up and running and uh, we're just finishing up the paint and the final touches. So, it should be done most probably by the end of this month. But tell me one thing, how do you go about the whole uh, law, legal aspect of it considering that... Uh, I'm not sure about Bombay or other places, but at least in Delhi, it's a bit of a struggle. I mean, uh, owning a, win a classic car, is there like a special registration process for these kind of cars? So, the deal is that in Delhi NCR, there is a special registration for vintage cars. Okay. 
So vintage cars is anything that's 50 years and older. You get these special VA plates. Right. Wherein you can pay uh, a certain amount for the re-registration of these cars. And then they can be driven on the roads uh, for rallies, for repair and maintenance purpose and for refueling. Uh, other than these three reasons, they can't be daily driven. But at least there's a legal status for these cars. So anything that's between 15 to 50 years is sort of ambiguity. So that's what we're constantly working on now is getting our status for these modern classics. Because these also are special. In another couple of years, you won't see any of these cars. Mm. And it's a part of our automotive history. Mm. Because mm. Uh, there are very few cars in India. And uh, we only have cars like in the automotive museum here that we have out in the outskirts of Delhi as mm. well. There are cars up till the late 70s. But what about the cars from the 80s to, uh, you know, the late 90s and early 2000s, all the modern classics? Hmm. Because they also are a part hmm. of the world automotive history and Indian automotive history as such. Hmm. So what we are trying to do is we're trying to preserve it as much as we can here. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, we try we drive the cars on private property and private roads. And that's what we have to constrict ourselves to at the moment. Hmm.